Welcome back. The video this week covers exercise 3-1 from Marox PHP and MySQL. This exercise looks at using PHP MyAdmin to work with a MySQL database. And if you're in my CIT336 class, you'll notice this exercise needs to be modified just a little bit. If you look at the overview page, it tells you to skip steps 1, 2, and 3. Uh, by default, you don't have the logout button, so that causes some confusion for students. And resetting the password seems to be a little problematic, and we don't want you to have to reinstall XAMPP to get to get uh, everything working again. So we start. We'll jump in and start on step four. And here we also need to make some modifications. If you followed the overview steps, then you would have downloaded guitar1.sql.zip. You would have created a database with the name something like this, student name underscore guitar1, and would have imported this S, this zip file into that database. You also would have gone to your users and created like an iClient user, student name iClient, and given them permissions on that database. So we do need to modify steps 4 and 5 a little bit. Steps 4 and 5 tell you to import the book file which is essentially the same database. It's got all the same tables and uh, data inside of it. The real difference is the one the guitar1.sql.zip provided in the course is easier to import in your remote host. So to keep your remote host and your local host the same, just use the guitar1.sql.zip, then you can have the same uh, database name on your local host and remote host, and you don't need to import the the file from the book apps directory. Okay, so set steps four. If you have your Guitar One database here, then we just want to make sure that this database is available with these three tables. So it looks good for step four. For step five. That was basically the import. So if you've got these tables, you can click on one and you can see data inside of it, then you're good for step five as well. So moving on to step six, it says select the database to display the tables for this database. So we can see our tables inside here, categories, orders, and products. And click the browse button to view the data for the products table. So if you click on browse next to products, you can see the data inside the products table. Okay, step seven is review the structure. So we click on the structure tab, and we notice a couple things here. We've got a null column, and this says this field can be null or nothing, and for all of these it's set to no, which means for any entry in this table you do have to have a value for all of these different, I different fields. Also note that the default here is set to none for each of them, so we don't have a default value for these fields. And that's what it's telling us to notice in step 7. So in step 8, it wants us to use the SQL tab to actually run some queries against this table. These queries come from the book. So it says run the first query from figure 3-4. I've got that copied down over here. So figure 3-4 on page 103. This is our first query. Go ahead and paste that in here, click go, and we get our results down here at the bottom. And we got a green check saying our query was successful, and then the results down below. Okay, then it tells us to run the second query. So you can either click on the SQL tab or go to the edit. I click back on edit, and here's the second query from figure 3-4. This is a select, and it has a clause to, to filter. So we've got a WHERE clause, and we also order by our list price. So click GO for that. You notice we've only got two columns this time, and it's all ordered by the list price. And as described in the query, all the prices are less than $500. So we go $299 to $499.99. Okay, step nine, we're running the query from figure 3-5. I've got that copied down. This is on page 105. Let me copy this query in. This one's a little more advanced. 
because it's joining two tables. We've got our products table and we've got our categories table. And we want data from both of them. Like the category name only exists in the category table, but the other two fields exist in the products table. So we want to kind of combine these two tables together and get data from both of them. Again, we've got a a filtering, so we do a where list price is greater than 800, and we order by list price again. So when I click go, we see we've got the category name, which came from the categories table, we've got the products from the product table, and the list prices for it. Okay, it says to modify the query, so the product, the price is less than $400. You can click go again, now we got a different result, actually just one item in our results. Okay, next one is run the first query from figure 3-6. So I'll go back to edit, copy the figure or query from 3-6 on page 107, and this one inserts data into our table. So we're inserting a new item. When you do an insert, you tell it which fields in the table you're inserting into, and then give it the values for those fields. So here a category would be 1, product code is going to be Tela, Product name is Fender Telecaster, and list price is $599. When I click Go, all I get is a check mark saying the query succeeded. It shows me the query again. If I want to see that act the actual data inside the table, I can click on the products table, and the last item down here at the bottom is that one I just inserted. So mine has a product ID of 12. If you're just running this, you might get a different product ID, but that's fine. It says for step 10, the last step is to run a delete on the product we just inserted. So mine has ID 12. I'll go modify that delete query to use product ID 12. And then we'll run this SQL. So I got a delete from products where product ID equals 12. Click go. Again, I get the green check mark saying it was successful. If I want to actually see that, I'll click on products, and I don't have a row 12 anymore. Okay, step 11 is experiment some more until you're sure you know how to code SQL queries. So I'm not going to do that in the video because it's more experimentation, but other queries from figure 3.6 where you have inserts, updates, deletes, those are all good things to try. If you want to try some more joins, those are a little more more involved, but they, they would be good practice. So try joining on some other items, some other fields, and that would all be great things to do. Okay, moving on to step 12. This one gets a little complicated because it asks us to log out of phpMyAdmin and we don't actually have a logout button at the moment. The reason we don't have a logout button is because phpMyAdmin by default is configured to not use it. If we want to turn it on, we need to go to our phpMyAdmin directory. Mine is under xamp phpMyAdmin, and in here you've got a config.inc.php. This is this configures phpMyAdmin. So if you open that up, you'll notice you've got this line that says uh, servers auth type is config. That means the configuration for phpMyAdmin, the login information comes from the config file, which is actually right here. The login is root with the password, uses MySQLi. I've added this other line that uses auth type of cookie instead. So I'm going to change that so I use the cookie authentication and that means uh, just saved this file cookie authentication means when I go to localhost PHP my admin it's actually going to ask me to log in so I can use my iClient user to log in my password and when I log in as my iClient user that I should have created when I imported this database. You'll notice I don't see all those same tables. I only see three now. I used to have a MySQL table and another a WordPress table. But since this user is more limited, 
I've only got a couple permissions on my guitar one table. I don't see those other tables I don't have access to. So this is sort of the equivalent of step 12. Your database probably doesn't have the MGS tester user, so I would use your iClient user to step 12, for step 12. For step 13, this one's a little bit problematic because our user, our iClient user, actually does have permissions to select data. So if I run a select star from categories, I'll actually get the data back because my user should have select permissions. If I want to actually test different permissions, we'd need to create another test user with more limited permissions. So I'll log out, log back in, set my config or my auth type to config again, localhost PHP my admin. So now I'm back in as my root user. I can see all the tables again. I'm going to go ahead and create a more limited user which I will call uh, Mike Nev Limited, just to test this out. Uh, host as localhost, and give him a password. OK. So now I've created this user. I'll go to my database, or back to users, server, users. Here's my limited user. I'll edit his privileges on the database. OK. Go. I'm going to give him insert, update, and delete, but no select, so we can see his select fail. And there we go. And now he's created and has permissions on that table. So we'll switch our type back to cookie. my Mike Nev limited user. And I still see my database, but if I try to run that select again, categories, I should get a permission denied because I don't have select permissions on that table. So that's what step 13 would look like. Uh, your iClient user should have those main permissions, insert, update, delete, and uh, select. Those are most of the permissions that you'll need for for anything we do in the course. And your iClient should have all that. It shouldn't have the other items like create database, create table, uh, a lot of those more advanced permissions. So that's really everything from the exercise. I'm going to log out here and switch my config so it uses the config file again. I don't want to have to keep remembering my login. And just test that that works. So yes, now I'm logged back in as the, the root user. And then the last step is just continue experimenting until you feel confident in using phpMyAdmin. There's not much to demo for that inside the video, so I'm going to end here. But let me know if you have any questions, and that's good for exercise 3-1.